All right, beautiful people. Today we are going to, let me bring my camera up. There we are. Today we are going to be looking at the rise of Laconia. We will examine Sparta as a city-state in the ancient Greek world. And then we will go on to look at life of Spartan men and life of Spartan women. We are rested firmly in the Mediterranean. We are, of course, looking at the Greek world. Remember, there is no such thing as the Kingdom of Greece or the Empire of Greece, just hundreds of city-states independent of each other in the Greek world, the world of the Hellas. This, imagine this entire land mass is a hand, all right? That's the Peloponnese. This is a part of Greece. The two middle fingers, if your hand is like this, if your hand is like this, the middle fingers, this is Laconia. This is home of Sparta. And you have to, if you've seen this film, and I have nothing against this film as a fun film to watch. I have nothing against this film. It's good. It's good. And if it gets you interested in ancient Sparta, even better. But please get everything you know about this film and throw it out the window. Please throw it out the window. Go downstairs walk outside, pour gasoline on it, set it on fire, do a dance, bury the ashes in the backyard, and then put bricks on top of it, all right? If you actually want to know about ancient Sparta, if you want to have a good time and watch a good film, fine, fine, but just get that out of your head. Let's look at Sparta. This is a city-state located in the Peloponnese in the region of Laconia, in the region of Laconia, the dark red region there, um, is Laconia. This is their region. This is their region. It's the equivalent of a city and then a state, right? The state of Laconia, the city of Sparta, and Sparta dominates Laconia. Um, you must know that the Spartans did not write about themselves an awful lot um, for a number of reasons. So a lot of what we get from the Spartans come from other sources. And oftentimes, this is less than complimentary. And so you have to take much of what I say and that's for all of the ancient world with some salt. Um, they were famous for their fighting, which we will get into, but please know that they were famous for their poetry, for their dancing, for their music. Uh, Sparta is a very, very, well, Laconia, pardon me, is a very fertile region. It's a very fertile region. However, natural resources are always an issue for any sizable population. And so that is going to come into play. Um, that being said, Sparta literally means I sow or to sow the land, right? S-O-W. Um, so it's a very fertile region of the uh, uh, Greek world. Early struggles, early struggles, early in Spartan history, they struggle with a few issues like all city-states of the uh, 600s, 700s. Three main issues plague Spartan society and all Greek society. And how the Spartans choose to uh, 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 fix this is very interesting. And it makes them very different from other people in the world. Forget the region. Number one was class inequality. In any society, you're gonna have some with more than others. Class inequality. Number two, social tension. Tension between classes, tension between groups, tension between clans, and finally, overpopulation. Now, how each city-state deals with this um, will shape its history, and Sparta choose to deal with it in its own way. Now, for much of the Greek world, the way they settled much of this was through colonization. If you're not happy here, if we're overpopulated, if you're not wealthy enough, then go on and form a colony in the south of France, in uh, uh, Spain, around the Black Sea. Sparta does not do this. Sparta does not, does not found um, colonies. The way in which Sparta fixes its social problems or attempts to fix its social problems are going to make it stand out among all of the other Greek city-states and all other civilizations um, in human history. The first thing that we have to know, the first word that we have to know is perioikoi. Peri oikoi, and I'm not going to bog you down with a bunch of Greek phrases. I'm not, I know. But peri oikoi literally means around dwellings, around dwellings. The Spartans between 800 and 500 
decided not to colonize across the Mediterranean. They colonize their immediate neighbors. They literally take over their neighbors. They subjugate them. They conquer them. They make them second-class citizens in Laconia. They are not slaves. They are considered half citizens. They're free, but they're not citizens. They live in the surrounding area around Sparta. They don't live in Sparta. That's for Spartans. But the perioikoi, I guess, would make the middle class with limited rights. They are the ones who perform trade. They're the ones who fish, who make uh, uh, pots, uh, fix your wheels. The perioikoi are second-class citizens in their own land, in their own land. Um, they could own land. They certainly could own land, um, but they are not at all considered equal to the Spartans of Sparta. So they're Laconian, but they're not Spartan. They colonize their immediate neighbors all around them. They make the perioikoi second-class citizens in their own land. So here is Laconia, right here. Perioikoi are from Laconia, but then the Spartans begin to look further out. They begin to look at Messenia right here. They're Greek. They are certainly Greek, but they are not going to be lucky enough to be made perioikoi. This is the next venture in the Spartan conquest of their immediate neighbors. That is the first Messenian War, 743 to 724 BCE. In the name of land conquest, the Spartans launch a war against their Greek neighbors. After 20 years of fighting, the Spartans are successful. Following the victory, the Messenians are made into state-owned slaves. State-owned slaves. And so Greek, not Greek, pardon me, Spartan society breaks down into three groups. A minority at the top are Spartans, full rights, the perioikoi, um, limited rights, and then you have the slave, the Messenians. They were known as helots. This is an entire slave class made up of Messenians who have no rights, zero rights. They are state-owned, and they work on state-owned land. Um, they are given out in allotments to landowners. They live in small homes in the countryside and work on land that used to be their own, that used to be their fathers, that used to be their grandfathers. Um, you would be an allotted an amount of helots to work in your home, to work on your plantation um, as a Spartan. This was your right by conquest to enslave your fellow Greeks. This was frowned upon in the Greek world, by the way. Having slaves was not frowned upon by any means, but to enslave your fellow Greeks was very much frowned upon. You were only supposed to enslave barbarians, those people outside of the Greek world and everyone outside of the Greek world to the Greeks was considered a barbarian. Now, with all of this new land, with all of this new land, class inequality begins to emerge more and more. Some men have vast estates while other men have, did I say men's? While other men have small plots of land, right? We have that in any society class inequality with the uh, bringing in of the helots. And these are slaves. These don't half think it. These are slaves and they're not going to buy themselves out of slavery. Your best bet is that you can maybe make it to a perioikoi and that was rare. And they toil in the land as slaves, as property. Your children are property. Your children's children are property. With all of this new land comes more arguments over uh, uh, um, uh Class, uh, uh, land distribution and, and social tension increases. We need certain reforms. And the way in which the Spartans uh, seek to fix these social problems is very interesting. This brings us to Lycurgus. Lycurgus, he is a legendary lawgiver of ancient Sparta. Did he exist? We believe so, but he might not have. But let's, for the sake of this lesson, argue he was a real man living and breathing who set about fixing Spartan society and ensuring 
that it works as a cohesive unit for centuries to come. Legend has it, he went to the Oracle at Delphi and sought advice. How do I make a society free of class divisions, social tensions? He set about reforming and he based all of these for reforms on three Spartan virtues. Three Spartan virtues. These are what Spartans ruled their lives by. Number one, equality among the citizens, among Spartans. Forget the periokoi, forget the heloids, the helots, but equality among the citizenry. No Spartan is better than another Spartan. No Spartan is more equal than another Spartan. Number two, military fitness. We have to stay uh, adept. We have to stay uh, uh, physically and mentally fit. Remember, Sparta was the only city that didn't have a wall. The tips of the spears of the warriors were their wall. And then finally, austerity. What does austerity mean? It means restraint, self-restraint. We have to live simply. We have to live in a disciplined fashion. This, these were the, 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 the cornerstones of Lycurgian reforms. And he goes about fixing Spartan society and setting up a system that will last for centuries. And according to the Spartans, it worked very, very well. What were the Lycurgian reforms? What were the Lycurgian reforms? Number one, sorry, I just wanted to show you this. This is to break down class inequality. We don't want the very rich and the very poor. That's why I showed you this image. We don't want this. This is a nightmare to, um, to a Spartan. You might see this in Athens. You might see this in other city states, not in Sparta. How do we do this? Okay, number one, the introduction of mess halls. Every man, every man was expected to at least eat dinner at the mess hall. These were communal banquets where every man would come at night. You're supposed to have every meal there, um, would come and eat meals. This was one way to break down class divisions, one way to build community, friendship, sitting with your neighbor and eating. Women were not allowed. Women ate in their own community mess halls. So we have mess halls. There's a Greek term for that. Um, I don't want to, it's the, it's, it's, I don't mind if I'm going to give it to you. It doesn't matter. It's confusing. Mess halls, M-E-S-H-A-L-L-S. Next, equal distribution of the land. Equal distribution of the land. Sparta has conquered a lot of land, and we will equally distribute it among the Spartans. Again, just Spartans. Equal division of lands to stop class inequality, to stop some men from being much richer than others. It happens regardless, even within Sparta. But we are trying to minimize this with equal distribution of land. This is an interesting rule. Spartans were not allowed to build homes with any tools other than a saw and an ax. Well, that seems strange to us, but think about it. We're not gonna have ornately carved wooden mantelpieces. We're not gonna have beautiful marble columns in our homes, no. Simple homes, that's all we need. That's all we need. Every man is expected to live in a simple, home. It should be comfortable, certainly, but there's no reason to show off your wealth. There's no reason to show you off your wealth. In fact, Spartan to this day means simple, simple. If you go to, into someone's home and they say, I have very Spartan tastes, that means simple. Not a lot of things on the wall, not a lot of things on the floor. Very, very simple. Those are the three rules. Finally, the fourth rule. Oh, by the way, here, let me show you some things real quick. This isn't a major rule, but it's a rule. You are not even supposed to dress ornately. You're not even supposed to dress a lot of rings, necklaces, incredibly wealthy uh, 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 fabrics. No, no. You don't show off your wealth. Even if you do have more wealth than others, you're not supposed to show it off. The Spartans also did away with currency. No currency. You can, you can trade, barter, etc. But currency is the root of all evil. Money is the root of all evil, is it not? Well, the Spartans believe that. Another thing they did was ban prostitution. This was unheard of in the Greek world. Again, men to be, need to be focused on their training. Prostitution opens up a number of issues in a, the ancient world as it does now. No prostitution. 
okay? But another one of these major reforms was the introduction of the agoge or agogi, A-G-O-G-E. And these were uh, uh, rigorous state-run training camps for Spartan boys and young men, state-run training camps. From a very young age, young men are taken from their families and given over to the state to be made into soldiers. They eat together, they train together. This builds bonds that will last a lifetime. Okay, so we have we have uh, mess halls, we have equal distribution of land, we have uh, simple homes, simple clothing, we have the development of the agoge. What sort of political system did the Spartans have? Well, theirs was a monarchy, but it's stranger than that. It's stranger than that. They're ruled by two kings. They are ruled by two kings that come from two different families. All right, you can choose from those two families. Um, the firstborn son of those families was exempt from the agoge because he could go straight into being trained as a king, but he could enter the agoge if he so choose. All Spartans were given equal political status. All Spartan men were considered equal. All Spartan men were considered equal. Um, the Periochoi didn't have a voice. The Helots certainly didn't have a voice, but two kings and a council of elders, a council of elders, uh, of nobles um, to oversee the king, to advise the king. We also have uh, five elected E4s, um, Again, I won't overly complicate things, but they would help oversee the government. So you have five elected elders, a council of elders ruling with two kings. One of the reasons two kings work so well is that one king could go off to war while the other king um, rules at home. Or if one king dies in battle, we're not without a king. We have a king ready-made. This is the Spartan system of government. They are very much against democracy, and we'll see later on um, how that works out. Spartan society, Spartan society. Well, it was dedicated and it was split into three distinct classes, three distinct classes. We have the Spartans who were equals. We have the Perioikoi who were half citizens uh, with limited rights. And we have the Helots, state owned slaves, working land, completely no say in anything. Now, Spartan men, were very different than other Greek men. Spartan men didn't trade. The Perioikoi did. Spartan men weren't at the market trading and haggling. No, that's beneath a Spartan. Spartan men didn't hunt or fish. Spartan men didn't make pots. Didn't make wagon wheels. And they certainly didn't labor in the fields. That was for the Helots. The Perioikoi took everything, took on everything else. The Helots slaved away in the fields. Spartan men trained for battle. And when they weren't training for battle, they were training for battle. And then after that, on a good day, they would also train for battle. They did other things, certainly. Music, dance, yes, yes. Reading, writing, yes. But at the end of the day, your one job as a Spartan was to become the ultimate killing machine for the health of the state. Life of a Spartan man. The honor of being a Spartan man did not come with birth. Simply being born into a Spartan family did not come with birth. No, no, no. It had to be earned. You had to be tested. And the first test, the first test came at birth. All Greeks practiced some form of eugenics, uh, selective breeding. Eugenics comes from uh, the Greek meaning well-born. What would happen is that when you were born, you would be inspected. You would be inspected, not by your parents. No, they're too tied to you. They would be inspected by village elders, and they would be looked over. They would be you'd, any physical deformities, abnormalities. Uh, maybe they don't quite react the way they're supposed to. Maybe there's a mental issue. Well, if you, if you did not pass the muster, of this inspection, you were cast off into a ravine, the place of rejection, the place of rejection. Now, other 
Greek city-states practiced eugenics, but they usually left the baby in the countryside, maybe to be discovered by a shepherd or raised by wolves. The Spartans don't want to take that chance. They want to annihilate you from the gene pool. They don't want the chance that you should return malformed. Women were also put through this, but to a much less degree. And so women always outnumbered men in Spartan society. Number one, because of this eugenics system. And number two, because men died at war and women didn't. And so uh, Spartan society always had more women than men. The Agoge, the Agoge. This is that state-run military system. This is that the, the, the government runs this. This is formalized. Every man is expected to go through this. A goge or a gogi literally means rearing, right? We are rearing these young men. We're making them soldiers of Sparta. At the age of seven, at the age of seven, a Spartan boy is given over to the agoge by his mother. And he is supposed to go willingly. And if he runs back, his mother pushes him back and says, you get out there. You get out there. You now belong to Sparta. You now belong to Sparta. He will attend the Agoge until age 12. His first year, his first year, he is put out into the forest. He is put out into the forest. He is expected to spend much of his time in the wild. Much of his time in the wild. He's fed a little bit, but not a lot. The only thing he's given is a cloak. And so that means he has to steal. He has to kill for his food, hunt, nothing but a cloak. And it gets cold in Greece. It gets very cold in Greece. If you are caught stealing, you are beaten, not for stealing, but for getting caught. We are trying to teach our soldiers. We are trying to teach our soldiers how to uh, uh, become the knight right? I mean, I don't want to liken it to becoming a ninja. I don't want to do that. Uh, but the eight-year-old boy in me wants to say that we are training these young men to be able to disappear and be cunning and be fast. After a year of this, if you survive, and not all young men survive this, more training, more training, more training, more training. At the end of your training, at age 12, you have to have a final test. You have to take a final test. What happens? What happens in this rite of passage is there's an altar covered in cheese. All right. This sounds crazy, but there's an altar covered in cheese and you have to approach this altar while older boys whip you with bull whips. You have to steal as many pieces of cheese as you can. Some boys died from being whipped. That was the final test. That was the final test of the lower agoge. Training continues. But could you imagine? Could you imagine? Oh, by the way, when you're in the forest, uh, the man in charge of you is just a little bit older than you. We put older boys in charge of the younger boys out in the forest, hunting around, foraging, and even in the training camp. But at age 12, you went through this rite of passage. And if you were lucky enough, you now got to receive more training. This the cryptea. This cryptea is a very, very mysterious rite of passage reserved only for the boys in the agoge that showed the most promise. If you're going to be a leader, if you've shown yourself to be cunning, to be smart, to be ruthless, then you will take part in the cryptea. What is the cryptea? Well, it's very, very dark. And historians argue of whether this is true or not. I choose to believe it. At age 12, you're done with the agoge, and you are given a knife and told to go off into the night. You have to avoid detection. You have to lay low and go into the valleys, and you hunt helots. You're expected to kill as many helots as you can. Those state-sponsored slaves in the cover of night don't get caught. Could you imagine being a helot? You're already a slave. You're already bought and sold. And in the night, in the night, young men armed with knives dressed in black cloaks are hunting you as a rite of passage. Could you imagine such a thing? I can't. 
absolutely terrifying. These Spartans, who were deeply religious and very, very cautious not to break any rules, would formally declare war on the Helots before this uh, uh, rite of passage would take place, as not to break the rules and anger the gods. They'd formally declare war on the Helots and send these young men out into the night. This was a way of keeping the Helots in a state of terror. The Spartans were always a minority. How do you keep an entire civilization, an entire population terrified, scared, not wanting to rise up and rebel against you? You use this tactic. I can think of other times. Think of the KKK following the American Civil War, where a small select number of people kept an entire population absolutely terrified. This is, to me, terrifying. Pederastry. This is a institution um, practiced across the Greek world that modern ears um, have trouble hearing, and, and, and for good reason. It's very, very foreign to us. What does pederasty mean? Well, it's the homosexual relationship between an adult male and a pubescent or adolescent male outside of his immediate family. This it actually comes from the Greek uh, 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 love of boys, okay? This by no means was uncommon in the Greek world, um, especially among Dorian Greeks who the Spartans were. An older man, an older man would take care of a teen's education, material needs with father's uh, permission. This was common in the Greek world. Uh, most, by the way, Athenians uh, disapprove of this. But in many parts of the Greek world, it is uh, uh, quite common. So in Sparta, it's mandatory. Okay, it is not. This isn't. This isn't something that you know two people can engage in. No, it's mandatory. At age twelve, you would be paired up. You would be paired up with a man between twenty and thirty. The older man was expected to take care of your material needs, uh, to care for you, to watch over you. Um, he serves as the boy's surrogate father, mother, and lover. Um, likely excluded full penetration, although they argue about that. This was seen as a way to instill emotional ties between the Spartans, between the troops. It was also a way to keep boys away from seeking young ladies not to be preoccupied with, 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 with females as teenage boys tend to be. Again, it's considered very foreign to our ears and eyes uh, for a number of reasons, obviously. But the Greek world, it's the ancient world. It's the ancient world. What about training? Well, following age 12, your training becomes actually even more intense. It becomes even more intense. However, reading, writing are also taught. Music is taught, by the way, uh, the horns would signal how to move in to speed up as troops. A horn would reach a special pattern to make a left. Oh, so you had to know how to read music, at least uh, from a military point of view. Um, dance was incredibly important to the Spartans as well, again, to help you in combat. But Spartan men certainly knew how to read and write. Uh, play music. They were known for their music. They were also known for their dance. They were also known for being excellent dancers. Remember, these men are training every day. They are in impeccable shape. They would have looked like Olympic athletes today had you came across these Spartans. You would just be shocked. You'd see them. You're like, my God, who are these people? They train every day. Um, this is not unheard of, by the way, for uh, football players to take dance, even um, martial artists to take dance for a number of reasons, uh, mind, body control, physical fitness. It makes sense. It makes sense. And Spartan men were no different. That being said, the main objective here was training and discipline. If I tell the Spartans to march and to sure death, they march. An army is only as good as its discipline. Isn't that what Sun Tzu said? He would have loved the Spartans. And so Spartan men drilled and trained, trained and drilled all through their teenage years. The mess houses. Now, I briefly spoke about the mess houses, and I'm not going to talk too much about it. Remember, the Spartans have destroyed the nuclear family. Your kids are taken from you. 
at 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 age seven. All right. So they're not raised with their father and their mother. Their dad and mom are eating at mess halls themselves. But this builds a sense of community. Mess houses were located outside of the city. Think uh, the Elks Club or a Masonic Lodge or the VFW. Men of all different classes, men of all different ages sit together every day and bond. You have you have a 50-year-old next to a 20-year-old. You have a rich man next to a poor man. These men are brothers in every sense of the world. They know their brothers more than they know their wives, their mothers, their children. This is how you build a community. Every man was expected to uh, contribute to the mess hall, contribute food, um, This is how you break down. This is how you break down social classes, social divisions. Um, by age, in your 20s, men were allowed to marry, but you were still expected to come and eat at the mess hall. You were still expected to eat at the mess hall. In fact, you weren't even supposed to really live with your wife until you were 30. You lived with your brothers. One of the most famous meals they ate as Spartans was a stew made of boiled pig's blood and vinegar. Boiled pig's blood and vinegar, known as black soup. You can go on YouTube. There are recipes for it. You are welcome to try it. You are welcome to try it. Apparently, it is absolutely terrible. But like a Spartan, that's all you need. You're not supposed to eat the finer things in life. You eat in order to live. You live in order to fight, right? That is your job as a Spartan man. A uh, Greek from Southern Italy once tasted this. This is in ancient times. And he said, ah, now I understand why Spartans are so willing to die after eating this pig blood and vinegar stew. Yummy, yummy, yummy. The homoioi, the homoioi, okay. Homoioi means those who are alike, homogenous, right? Uh, homo. At 30, you were considered, at 30, you were considered a full citizen. You were considered a full citizen. You're given a parcel of land, a group of helots. You can live with your wife if you so choose. You join the assembly in order to have your voice heard. Um, you could live at home, you could live at home, but you take your food at the mess hall. You take your food at the mess hall and you enter into a Spartan life. You continue to train. You have your slaves working the land that you've been given. This is the life of the Spartan. At age 60, at age 60, like an old warrior, you can retire from military service, return to your wife, return to your home. You can sit on the council of elders, oversee court cases, et cetera. Um, but again, age 60 in the ancient world might as well be age 95. You don't have much more time here anyways, but that's okay. Spartans are supposed to die on the battlefield, not comfortable in bed. Here is the council of elders ruling with the king not a democracy. Please know that. The hoplites, what are we training to be as Spartan soldiers? We are hoplites. We are hoplites. That's infantry. That is infantry. We are hoplites. Named after the shield, the hoplong, you are given a, a spear and a sword. This is your life. Now, this is the way Greek soldiers fought in a phalanx. Lined up, shoulder to shoulder with your hoplong and your spear and you marched and you marched or across the greek world this form of fighting evolved you can see this man over here is making music to tell his soldiers which way to go the officer is making a call the musician shouts it off this is how we communicate thousands of men on the battlefield every greek city-state had hoplites that fought in a phalanx a phalanx are those lined up soldiers like that. However, in the rest of the Greek world, these were commoners. They'd go home, they'd be a, a, a fisherman, they'd be a craftsman, 
they'd be a poet even right it was it was it was the role of the citizenry to be a member of the army to protect the homeland or you know the fatherland um the spartans were different this is all they did and they didn't put in the rest of the greek world you'd have different shields to mark who your family was no the spartans don't do that by the way only the richest could serve in these infantries across the a greek world because the equipment was incredibly expensive the poor couldn't fight in these phalanxes but the spartans this was government issued this was government issued equipment you got given this by the state and by the way it's very much related to greek culture okay so you hold your ground you hold your ground well part of your shield is blocking the man next to you. And so if you drop that shield and run, you've opened this man up. And so all of us as a society have to work together and you better not break your rank. I don't care what in the hell's coming at us. You hold the line. You hold the line because if one man breaks, they all break and you will be shamed forever. That's across the Greek world. But the Spartans take this very, 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 very seriously. You can see the phalanx at play in riots across the world, police still use a form of the phalanx. It's a very, very, very um, utilitarian and, 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 and uh, 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 I'm looking for a word here that's not coming to me. It works. How about that? It works. Now, other Greek phalanxes would employ archers. The Spartans, for most of their history, did not employ archers. They thought it a feminine weapon because archers can stand far back and shoot to them that is cowardice no you meet a man eye to eye and you hear him as he moans in agony as you run your sword through his stomach that's what a, a spartan would say unlike other greek city states we gave our soldiers their uniforms and they matched they matched they matched they matched with the letter of sparta on their shield this is what uh a society dedicated to war looked like. They certainly didn't look like this. Again, it's a good movie, but no, they had breastplates and, 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 and arm uh, uh, and, and, and shin plates and helmets and, and they didn't go shirtless. They didn't go shirtless into war. And they usually never, sometimes they did. Sometimes they did actually at Thermopylae, they do. They break ranks and fight individually, which is unheard of among Spartans. But this was seen as cowardice or foolishness. If we're all lined up and I decide, you know what? I'm going to do this myself. And I run and I break, I break the line and I run up to the guys in front of me. I've now left all of my comrades open. Shame on you. No, you hold the line and you wait for your commander to tell you what to do and where to go. Hold the line. There's so many things wrong with this picture. There's just, I just, I don't, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> I want to see him return to Laconia and walk up to the Spartans and go, what's up guys? Are you going to go fight today or what? <laughs> this is what they most likely would have looked like. Uh, we find a lot of their armor, but again, what was painted on them, how it was painted, that is up for debate. What about women? What about women? I just told you uh, earlier in this lesson that women outnumbered men in Spartan society because of eugenics and because of deaths in battle. I'm going to tell you right now, I can tell you right now that the Greek world was very conservative when it came to women. Surprise, surprise. In the rest of the Greek world, women rarely left the house. Women could not inherit land. Women had no real say in anything, in anything except for the life of a Spartan woman. Spartan women couldn't vote. Spartan women couldn't sit on the council of elders, but Spartan women enjoyed a tremendous amount of freedom. They left the house. They gossiped on the street, unheard of in the rest of the Greek world. Spartan women, because men were so gone, had a tremendous amount of responsibility. More often than not, it was the women telling the helots what to farm. It was the women telling the perioikoi, oi, go to the city and trade this for this. It was the women. They have a tremendous amount of freedom. And unlike the rest of the Greek world, they didn't marry at age 12. No, no, that was seen as unhealthy. You can't have a woman having kids at age 12. She might miscarry. 
The average Spartan woman got married at 18 when she was fully developed. See, everything is for making healthy soldiers. And so Spartan women were expected to remain incredibly fit. Upbringing of a Spartan woman. They exercised every day, just like the boys. They uh, got involved in sports. They learned a great number of physical things. They danced, played music. Again, they were uh, uh, incredibly, incredibly uh, uh, free in their upbringing. By the way, just as an aside, um, Greek women were known, sorry, Spartan women were known for being absolutely gorgeous. Play after play mentioned Spartan women being particularly fantastically beautiful. One of those reasons is because they were expected to remain physically fit because a healthy woman, a fit woman has healthy boys. And that's what we need in Sparta. Healthy boys make healthy soldiers. Healthy soldiers make a healthy state. And so Spartan women were famous throughout Greece for being incredibly beautiful. Greek play after Greek play, the pretty girls, always the Spartan girl. Um, Spartan women partook in sports. Uh, physical agility was very, very important to them. Dancing, they were famous, famous for dancing. And when they would dance, their uh, dresses would pull up. And so they were known uh, as, uh, as thigh flashers. That was a nickname for Spartan women, thigh flashers, because you could see their thigh. Again, Greek women covered themselves, not these Spartans. Look at these, outrageous. There was one particular dance that Spartan women were famous for. Um, they would jump up in the air and slap their backsides with their own feet, making a clap noise. They were famous for this. Um, that shows you their physical agility. Uh, remember, Helen of Troy was actually from Sparta. Talk about the most beautiful woman, the woman who launched a thousand ships, the woman who brought about the Trojan War. There you go. She's from Sparta. For It's almost like the 1950s. You know, like in the 1950s, every pretty girl was from California. Anyone who's been to California knows that's not necessarily true, but that's the idea. Well, for Greeks, that was the idea. Spartan women were absolutely gorgeous and incredibly, incredibly free. They would be seen on the streets buying and selling, talking, trading, etc. They were also known for their outspokenness. Okay, so you come from a society where women cover themselves, they don't leave the house, and you arrive in Sparta, and these Spartan women would tell you off. They'd make fun of you. Greek men were not used to this. Greek men were not used to this. In fact, the Spartans were famous for their dry wit, for just biting you. It's actually, to this day, it's still around, laconical. If someone is laconical, they're incredibly, their wit is incredibly dry. Um, really good British humor, not all of it by any means, is very laconical. And Greek women gave it. They gave it all the time. Sorry, I say Greek women, Spartan women. And when visitors arrived from other places, they were shocked. They were mad. They hated it. How dare you? And they were good at it. It's one thing to be insulted, but then you're insulted and they do a good job of it absolutely terrible and the women would tell off the men there's a great story this guy he's telling a story about all of his uh, uh, uh this battle where all of his uh, uh friends died in this battle and a woman turns to him and says you know that's a great story shouldn't you have joined them meaning what are you doing alive if all of your boys died why didn't you stay there until you were dead Ooh, <laughs> that is biting that is biting a young man once complained to his mother that his sword was too short. Mom, my sword is too short. I'm terrified. She says, easy, take a step forward. Your sword won't be sh too short any anymore. That's good. That is good. There's other stories uh, that I could tell you, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave those out. There's their most famous. The most famous is Spartan women, according to legend, used to tell their husbands, uh, return with your shield or on it. I'm sure you might've heard this. Okay, so when you die in battle, when you die in battle, they use your shield as, um, as a, a carrier, right? As a carrier, you, you're on your shield and they carry you back home. A gurney, I guess would be the term. Um, in battle, you never drop your shield because not only are you putting yourself in danger, remember you're putting the person next to you in danger. And so if you return with your shield, that means you dropped it and ran. You die holding that shield. 
And so Spartan women, when their husbands went off, return with your shield or on it. That to me says everything about Spartan women. Marriage. What about marriage? Well, for the most part, Spartan women could marry who they chose, unheard of in the Greek world and the ancient world especially. Men married between ages 28, 29, 30. Women usually married around 18, much earlier in other Greek city-states. But the way in which the way in which the Greek, the Spartans, pardon me, consummated their marriage is very strange. Okay, so they get married. They get married. And then there was a strange Spartan custom that is still very, very, very strange. On the night of her wedding, the Spartan woman would have her head shaved. She would have her head shaved. Okay, all right, all right. She would then, she would then dress in a man's cloak and sandals, cloak and sandals, and be left in a dark room while her husband ate in the mess hall. Okay. Well, at some point in the night, the husband would sneak into the room, push his wife, his bride, onto a bed of hay and consummate the uh, marriage. This is very strange. This is very strange. Um, it seems clear that this ritual was meant to allow men who have only ever been with other men the ability to have something familiar, right? We dress her as a boy, we shave her head, and in the night, he sneaks to the window and he has his way with her and then leaves back to the mess hall. This, by the way, could go on for years. This could go on for years. Just so you know, just so you know, men that didn't give their wife a child who didn't perform their husbandly duties um, would be ostracized in the street. Other women would say, hey, why aren't you, why are you, what, Leonidas, what are you doing here? Go home. Your wife's not pregnant. You'd be teased by the women if you weren't giving your woman what she uh, uh, demanded of you, the right, the ability to make Spartan soldiers. Interestingly enough, interestingly enough, across the uh, Greek world, if a woman slept with anyone other than her husband, it was punishable by death. However, in the Spartan world, with permission, with permission, if I can't give you a child for whatever reason, or I'm too old, but you're still fertile, I can give you permission to sleep with a handsome, fit young warrior to breed for the nation. And many Spartan women partook of this uh, a strange custom, unheard of in the rest of the world. But again, with the husband's permission. Very, very, very strange, strange world of the Spartans. We are going to leave Laconia next time and go to the region of Attica, where their capital, Athens, emerges as another major player in the Greek world. But Athens isn't alone. Athens isn't alone because we are also going to examine an empire that we've seen before, the biggest empire the world has ever seen up to this point. That is the Persian Empire that extends in this whole swath, the whole swath and butts up right up against the Greek world. We are going to see the rise of Attica and Persia peeking into Europe, looking around the corner, and thinking, why not that region as well? We will see how all of that works out next time. Thank you so very, very much until we meet again.